A good sermon, like a good building, begins with a solid frame. The frame of the sermon is the outline. Framing a sermon establishes the structure to which we will attach the content. The information about the text, the illustrations and the applications are like the walls, windows and doors of the sermon. Without a good framework, all the good ideas we preach will not hold together. The sermon collapses under its own weight. The simplest frame for a sermon uses the key word model for preaching. The key word preaching model works like this. Start by asking a question in the introduction, then answer the question with your big idea. Introduce a key word that explains your answer. For example, there are three principles, or there are four solutions, or two lessons that we can learn from this passage. Use your key word for each main point to establish the framework for the sermon. For example, the first principle we see in the passage is, and then state the point on which you will hang your content. How can we say it so people remember it? There are some basic communication principles for framing a message. These principles are not arbitrary or rigid. They are merely sound observations about effective communication. Communication is the transfer of meaning from the mind of the source to the mind of the receiver. If our objective is the communication of the ideas, then anything that enhances that transfer is beneficial and anything that hinders the transfer is detrimental. As Christian medical doctor Richard Swenson warns, the brain is capable of thinking at a rate of 800 words per minute, far exceeding the speed of caution. Be careful of your thoughts, for they might break into words at any moment. The first communication principle is the principle of selection. Martin Luther said those preachers who say whatever comes into their mouths remind me of a maid going to market. When she meets another maid, she stops and chats a while. Then she meets another and talks with her too, and then a third and a fourth, and so gets to market very slowly. So with preachers who wander off the text, they would like to say everything at one time, but they can't. The preacher must be ruthless in his selection of content to include in the sermon. He must discard whatever is irrelevant to the development of his dominant idea. By this time, you will have vast amounts of information and insight into the text that must be discarded or kept for another time and place. If you are not ruthless at this point, the sermon will lose effectiveness. Perhaps 50% of the material you gather in preparation will not actually be used in the sermon if you are preparing properly. The second communication principle is the principle of generalization or summarization. Many sermons fail because the preacher talks about people, events, historical details, interesting illustrations, and effective applications, but never gets to the point never arrives at significant generalizations. We must learn to summarize all of the detail in key points. This ability to generalize is difficult. We don't want vague, fuzzy generalizations, but rather significant, clear generalizations. It is very important mental discipline to be able to generalize significantly. One researcher noted about the great 18th century preacher George Whitfield, the basis of Whitfield's mind, or that power on which his singular gifts as a speaker worked, was the conceptive faculty. I find that a good thesaurus is invaluable for this part of the process. But remember, we are not trying to find obscure words. We are not trying to impress people with our vocabulary, nor are we trying to find creative alliteration. The words should be common words that everyone will understand, otherwise the generalizations are useless.
We live in an age of visual learning. We can learn a lesson from the advertising media today, as Terry Mattingly points out. Advertisers don't just tell us what they want to say. They show us through the images what they want us to see. The advertising model works like this. See the image, feel the need, buy the product, accept the results by faith. Mattingly writes, whether they realize it or not, millions of people make professions of faith at the shopping mall. We want to turn ears into eyes. We must capture the listener's attention by what he hears with his ears, but he will remember what he sees in his mind. In this age of visual learning, our media culture, that is a difficult task. We must be able to make significant generalizations that summarize the ideas in memorable ways. If not, we will end up like the great Puritan preacher Richard Baxter, who once reached his 65th point in a single sermon. People cannot follow all that detail, so summarize your thoughts under generals. The third communication principle is the principle of particularization or specification. Charles Shedd in his book, The Exciting Church, said, the job of the preacher is to electrify, edify, and specify. We must balance the generalization principle by noting that if all we do is generalize, then the sermon becomes vague and fuzzy. Good preaching is consistently moving back and forth between generals and particulars, just like good thinking. We cannot stay in one area exclusively because we will either become too vague or too detailed. Either way, it is boring. Good preaching is like climbing up and down a ladder between generalization and particularization. We call this ladder the abstraction ladder. The higher you climb on the abstraction ladder, the more abstract your words become. Assets, or produce, are much more abstract words than fruit or apples. The most concrete level would be an actual apple. In terms of preaching, life applications are concrete and big principles are abstract. Some preachers are all abstract in their sermons with no life apps. Other preachers are all life apps and no principles to guide life. This is called dead level abstracting. Dead level abstracting kills the sermon either way. It is very important that we understand that we must climb up and down that ladder frequently in a single sermon. A good message has both generals and particulars. A good sermon has both general principles and specific illustrations and applications. The fourth communication principle is the principle of universals. We must learn to principalize the passage, as theologian Walt Kaiser put it. Principalizing the process of finding the universal truth in your passage that transcends the specific context. A, a universal truth is something that is true in every age and in every culture. We need to learn the technique of stating our points in ways that are relevant to our lives today. One of the great dangers in preaching is developing a lecture stance and delivering a history and grammar lesson it's not just that your central idea must be stated in contemporary terms, but all of your points should be stated in contemporary terms as well. State your points applicationally. Each main point should be composed with the listener in mind. The contemporary life parallels that you have identified in your passage should frame the points of the sermon. The outline should connect directly to the contemporary life parallels that you see in the passage. Each point in the outline should be framed as an application. 
and stated in the present tense. The message is not about what happened to them long ago and far away, but what the passage says to us now. The fifth communication principle is the principle of subordination. Each point is a pointer. Main ideas point to the big idea. Sub-ideas point to the main ideas. Keep your sermon outline as simple, clear, and memorable as possible. You should rarely go to the third level in your outline. Stay at the first or second levels in your outline because people simply cannot follow more detail. They will get confused as they listen to you. Remember, each point is a pointer. You are pointing your listeners beyond themselves to a fresh encounter with God and his word. You are calling people to see what is bigger and greater than their earthbound circumstances. Big ideas should be big because God is big. A well-constructed sermon points to bigger truths. Each point is a point to what God is saying in his word, which is why it helps to carefully construct the points of your sermon in advance. Write them out. As has been said, thinking makes a wise man, reading makes a full man, but writing makes a clear man. Should your sermons have three points or not? During medieval times, there was a rigid structure for sermons in England. The sermon had to have a main theme divisible by three significant words. Robert de Basevorn in 1322 wrote, This rule may be judged by the desire to reverence the Trinity. Not true, of course. The frame of the sermon is controlled by four foundational factors. The central idea of the sermon, the purpose for preaching, the structure of the passage, and the contemporary life parallels. We frame a sermon like a builder frames a window. The surrounding structure gives the building structural integrity. Let me illustrate the process of framing the message with structural integrity. The first step is to make sure that we understand the structure of the passage itself. We must revisit our structural diagram in order to frame our sermon according to the diagram. For example, here is a structural diagram of 1 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 4, using the New American Standard translation. We will frame our sermon with two major points corresponding to the two hinge points introduced by the connectives 4. The two major points will summarize each section of the unit of thought. Then there are two contrasts in each section of the passage. Each contrast explains each main point and hinges on the but in each section. When we put that structure together with our central idea and our purpose for preaching, we are ready to frame the sermon. Notice that our points follow the structure of our passage. Each main idea points back to the central idea, and each subordinate idea points back to the main ideas. The points are all stated applicationally and in the present tense for a contemporary audience. Our objective is to encourage believers to speak the gospel with integrity. We shape the sermon like a sculptor shapes the clay into an image. The material is the same for every preacher, but the artistry is dependent on the skill of the artist to shape the raw material. Different preachers utilize the same material, and yet one sermon is dull and the other exhilarating. There are four basic shapes that sermons take. First, we have megaphone sermons. Our outlines are deductive outlines. We start with the central idea and develop it. This is the most common pattern for preaching. Start with the central idea in your introduction and develop that idea in the body of the sermon. It works particularly well in the Pauline epistles because they are particularly deductive in their structure. 
Second, we have funnel sermons. Our outlines are inductive outlines. We start with small ideas and lead to the big idea. In this pattern, the entire sermon leads up to the central idea, which is not presented until the conclusion. However, all the points in your sermon must relate to the central idea just as much as in a deductive sermon. This type of sermon works best with narrative and parabolic passages since it is primarily the method of storytelling. Third, we have hourglass sermons. Our outlines are combination outlines. We start with small ideas that lead to a big idea and then specific small ideas flowing from that big idea. This form leads up to the central idea that occurs in the middle of the sermon. Then the central idea is developed deductively from that point on in the message. This form works well with poetry and prophetic literature. It is also very effective when the central idea is a proposition that leads to results. We start by proving the proposition and then showing how the proposition leads to certain results. Fourth, we have cycle sermons. Our outlines form cycles that lead back to the central idea and then into new thoughts that cycle back to the central idea. The sermon is cyclical in form. Each cycle expands on the previous cycle. This form works well with some narrative texts since many stories are cyclical in nature. The Hebrew model for communication was cyclical, as are many Eastern cultures today. Books like 1 John are highly cyclical in form. I see many younger preachers using this form quite effectively in their preaching today. They keep cycling back to the central idea and expanding on it with each turn of the wheel. Some sermons are like doors in the middle of nowhere. They are not anchored to the text, so the message came from nowhere and it's not going anywhere. Other sermons are like tracks in the sand. They have no staying power. The first tide of the work week washes the message away. Some sermons are like sagging barns. There is structure to the sermon, but it sags under the weight of the content. There is so much information that listeners cannot grasp what the message has to say to them as they face their week. When people finish listening to a sermon, if they say, I heard the preacher say many good things, but I couldn't follow him. I had no idea where he was going with his sermon then we have failed. Our messages must have structural integrity to stand the winds of the work week.